Good evening, everyone. Thank you for those of you in St. Louis for joining us tonight on a very rainy evening. My name is Amy Lutz, and I'm honored to serve as the Manager of Communications and Social Media for the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. We're very excited to have all of you tonight for this exciting program. As many of you know, especially if you've joined us for one of our previous presentations, the museum is currently undergoing a $21 million expansion, and we're very excited to open late next summer, in summer 2022. Uh, the new museum will be about four times the size of the previous museum, which served the community faithfully and with great educational programs for over 25 years. We're very excited to be able to share the new institution with you next year and to share the progress with you over the next several months. In the meantime, we're grateful to be able to offer a series of virtual presentations like tonight's with Leah Garrett. To introduce our speaker tonight, I would like to turn things over to our associate curator, Jillian Howell. Jillian. Thank you, Amy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program. And welcome to Leah Garrett, author of X Troop, The Secret Jewish Commandos Who Helped Defeat the Nazis. Um, I can personally say this is a very exciting book, uh, a little bit more like an action movie than your traditional narrative history. And to tell us a little bit more about it, Leah Garrett. Hi everyone. Um, so thank you so much for coming. And um, Jillian and I are gonna be in discussion about the book, but I think before we talk, I'll just briefly tell everybody about X Troops so people know uh, who these guys were. And then I think she's gonna do a bunch of questions and I love questions from the audience. So I hope people will type in questions from the audience into the Q and A as well. So the X troop were a secret commando unit of uh, Jews, German, most, most of them from Germany and from Austria. And they were created in 1942 when, um, when Churchill was really worried about what was happening with the war. So Churchill and Lord von Batten decided that they had to do something very unique as a way to combat sort of the, the Nazis. And they created this top secret uh, commando unit X troop, troop. And what the primary aspect of it was, was that it would be composed of German speakers. And they didn't really think this through, but of course at this point in time in 1942, the vast majority of German speakers are Jewish refugees from Germany and Austria. So the men who end up becoming the X troop, um, I'm, I'm sure Jillian will ask more detailed questions, but most of them come, when they're young, 15, 16, 17 years of age, many of them come on the kinder transport, which their parents put them on in order to save their lives. Um, it was run by the Quakers and it was a way to get Jews out of Germany and Austria children. They arrived in the UK and, and I, I'm sure we'll talk in more detail sort of how they ended up in the X troop. But once they were selected for the X troop, um, a really important aspect of the story was that all of them were given about five to 10 minutes uh, to come up with a fake British name, a British backstory about why they had a German accent. And also they all had to wear Church of England dog tags. So if they were killed in battle, they would be buried under crosses. Now, the reason that they did this was because one, Firstly, they wanted to be a secret troop that the Germans didn't know about, that there were this, this commando unit of German speakers who would be the tip of the spear. But secondly, the commanding officers were very much aware that if any of these guys were caught, they would not only be killed because they were commandos, because Hitler had done a commando edict, they would be killed as Germans because they're Germans fighting their own country and they would be killed as Jews. And worst of all for these guys, if there was any family anywhere still in uh, Europe, they would probably be rounded up. So they were all of them fought the war, pretending to be British with fake British names and pers personas. So when I wrote the book, they all moved between two different names, their birth name and the name that they're given in war. And um, just one more point, and then we can go into more detail about them, which was, it quickly became evident to the British military when they were training these guys that they were phenomenal. They were extraordinary, not only because they were fluent in German, but also because for them, the war was personal and that they, they were completely dedicated to beating the Nazis. So the military made this decision about the X troop, which they'd done with no other commando unit, which was that these guys would never fight together as their own unit 
but because they were so important, they would be parceled out in twos and threes and fours to existing commando units. And these guys would be the leaders in existing commando units. So it was, it was not only to protect the troop because look, if there's a roadside bomb, we don't wanna lose all these guys, but also because they'd be so crucial with other people. And the British were right in the course of the war, and I'm sure we'll talk in more detail, these guys were absolutely crucial in most of the main uh, central battles of war World War II. They were at the front of everything. And for them, the war doesn't end when the war ends for other people in 1945. The British military still realizes how important they are. And they're the guys who are used for the denazification efforts after the war as well. So they're the ones who are gonna round up the Nazis. They're gonna get evidence for the Nuremberg trials. So their time, the story I tell of these men, um, because this book is as much about World War II as it is about the Holocaust. So I tell the story in particular of three of them, but I tell the whole troop story basically from childhood through their post-war lives, because I, I, I was very um, conscious of the fact that in my mind, too many World War II histories don't talk about the Holocaust. And for me, this was a central part of the story because all these guys were refugees and they were all Holocaust survivors. And I think we've answered my next question for the most part, um, how these men ended up in the UK, uh, the kinder transports bringing them over, um, in your research, was there an apparent drive in them from being refugees? Um, I, I, I suppose really their identities drive them to right. act the way they did in war, to be the soldiers they were. Yeah, so these guys, um, when we talk about specific battles, we'll kind of get into this stuff, but the thing I kind of say over and over, but again, about these men, and there was 87 of them, was that for them, the war was completely personal. It wasn't an anonymous thing. Look, every day that Hitler was out there, Hitler was not only you know attacking allies or killing people generally, he was killing their hometown family members. He was killing their uncles and their moms and their dads. So for them, what was really crucial as refugees was that their job they felt was to Get, get rid of this guy who's intent on destroying not only the world generally, but specifically their own families. And um, CNN asked me to write an editorial for them about X Troop. And they said, what was the most important thing you got out of this book? And I said, one of the most important things I got out of this book, I got a lot of things out of it, was the sense that um, particularly in the British um, army, refugees were so, these guys were so important. They made it so the British won the war. And the British didn't realize that about refugees, something I didn't mention, I'll talk about it briefly now, was when the war breaks out, these guys, like I said, they come on kinder transports, you know, they've, they're slowly losing family members to the Holocaust, they're by themselves, it's, it's terrible, they get to the UK and they're treated really well at first, because, you know, people are taking care of them. But when the war breaks out, there's this really dark chapter in British history that people don't know about here, and they really don't know about in Britain. And the book has ha had like huge press in the UK, and I think it's a lot has a lot to do with this aspect of it, which was that Churchill declared cholera the lot, and what that meant was they were um, there was a lot of agitation agitation in the British press, very xenophobic about German speakers, right? And 85% of the refugees from Germany are Jews at this point. And so Churchill and the British military decided what they would do was they would in turn and lock up the most dangerous of all the German speakers. And th these would be single men. And these guys were all single men. So basically every single ex trooper before he gets to the point at which he's selected for this incredible commando unit, um, is actually interred in an internment camp behind, it's, I have a chapter called Behind, Behind Barbed Wire. Some of them were interned in the UK and it was bad, but it wasn't horrific, but it was really bad. But a number of them were actually shipped to Australia and Canada. And I write about one of those ships, which was like a voyage of the damned. And I got to interview a command, living commanders when I wrote the book who talked about 
um, this very anti-Semitic crew. And a bunch of them were sent to the outback in Australia and they were the Denera boys. And they spent a year there before, and they said the hardest thing about it was not having any news from home. So by the time they're selected to be in this commando unit, they have gone through the absolute horrors of the world. And for many of them, there was a feeling when they got to the UK, okay, now, now I'm safe. Their parents thought they were safe. They felt safe for that first year. And then they start getting locked up by the British. So this was all a motivation, but sort of to weigh against that, when they're selected to be commandos, um, and they all, you know, I did so much research for this book and it, there were archives all over the world and they were, uh, most of them were interviewed after the war in different places, like Stephen Ambrose interviewed a bunch of them for his books. And so there was a huge amount of material that nobody had ever used for a book before. And the thing that they would say over and over again after the war was um, they, their view of the British wasn't focused on the fact that they'd been interred. And I'll talk later about after the war, there were struggles to get them naturalized. Their real focus, particularly as refugees, to get back to your question, was this insane and deep and total sense of gratitude to the British, as they said over and over again, for giving me the arms and saying, okay, you go fight. So final point, um, in the United States, there was also a German speaking Jewish, primarily Jewish unit called the Ritchie Boys, but the Ritchie Boys were all counterintelligence officers. These guys are different. These guys, the X troop, are all trained in counterintelligence. So if they capture Germans, they're gonna interrogate them on the battlefield in German. But this is really crucial and different from what America did. They're also all trained as commandos and they're all trained in weapons and in capturing and killing Nazis. So they're given both roles. Their job when they land with different commando units is to first capture or kill or whatever it is with the Germans. And then once they're there in the heat of battle to interrogate them. So it's, it's an incredibly unique unit. And part of why it was so important in the war was because these guys were duly trained unlike the Ritchie boys who just had the counterintelligence training. So these men are in internment camps um, at probably one of the lowest, most difficult points in their life. How do they get chosen to be commandos? Who's looking at them and thinking, this is the man right here for the job? That's a great question. So they're all, so they're all interred, right? For and basically into the Pearl Harbor attack. And then Churchill realizes we got to get all these guys out of internment. They're all given the choice that they can join the military at this point, but they're only allowed to join something called the Pioneer Corps, which is a hard labor corps. They're not given weapons. They're not trusted with weapons. They're put in um, these foreigner uh, groups. And these guys were itching and desperate to get a weapon and to go fight and to go try and save their families and to go kill Nazis. So they kept writing letters to their commanding officers saying, oh my God, please, like, please let me in the proper military. One of the guys I talked about, Manfred Gans, sneaks off and does the test for the, to be an RAF pilot. They select him to be an RAF pilot. They quickly realize he's an enemy alien. He's not allowed to do it. So, you know, they're in the Pioneer Corps for, for about six months to a year when this, uh, this uni new unit is created by Churchill and Lord Mountbatten. And they know where to find their guys. They know that they just have to go to the Pioneer Corps and say to the commanding officers, who is itching to, to fight who knows German? And so they either go and select them or they put signs up on all the boards saying, um, we need volunteers for um, dangerous duty. And these guys are like, I wanna do that, I wanna do that. So eventually they select a couple hundred of them and they bring them to London and MI5 interrogates them for, for, for days and days and days. And they're interrogated about, you know, why do you wanna serve? What, what, what's motivating you? One of the guys I write about, Colin Anson, he wanted to serve because his dad had been taken to Dachau and killed there and he just loved his dad. They all had personal reasons, but they also all had to be able to show that they were very physically capable and really intelligent because that's the, the unique thing about them is to be a commando, you have to be incredibly physically capable. To be a counterintelligence officer, you have to be really fast on your feet and be very, very smart. 
So then out of those hundreds, um, MI5 and um, the British military pick 87 of these guys and select them. And they, they themselves knew this was crazy. One of the guys whose memoir his daughter shared with me um, wrote in the memoir, like I went into this interview not, it was something like I went into this interview not being trusted to, to hold anything more dangerous than a, a, like, a, like a shovel. And now I'm being told that I'm gonna be given guns and I'm gonna be a commando. Like who wouldn't find that crazy? Like they knew this was crazy in 24 hours, but the British really needed them. So they're all selected and they're sent to Wales for training. And that training, so it seems like they start with this really harrowing, they're in an internment camp and then they come and get interviewed for days on end. What does the training look like after that? The training, I mean, when I read this book, there were so many crazy moments of the, the, the story of these men. I mean, this was another crazy moment. So the guy who is the commanding officer is a Welsh man named Brian Hilton Jones. And he's wonderful. He's like the father figure. They love him dearly. He's the best CO ever to these guys. They were very lucky to have him. And because he's Welsh, the training then takes place in Wales. And he's determined he's gonna make them the best fighting unit in the British military, and, and he did. But to do that and to train them, like I said, as commandos and in counterintelligence, that takes a lot of time. So they ended up, because they're commandos, rather than them being billeted in like a dormitory, they're all given a couple of bucks and told to walk around this little seaside Welsh village called Aberdovey and go find yourself somewhere to live. It's so bizarre. So they're doing these German accents. They all have these fake names that they, they've just been given and they can't even remember who, what their fake name is and what their, this guy's fake name is because they all kind of knew each other from the Pioneer Corps. And then they go live. I mean, and most of these guys are like really cultured young men from like Vienna and you know art and music. And they're told, go find a little house in this Welsh village and you're gonna go live with these people for up to a year while we do the training. And they did. And, and when they got to the homes, they were told, you know, we're gonna put into storage anything with your real name on it. Like if you have a book with your name or a doc, we're just gonna take everything. And they had to do this complete metamorphosis while living with Welsh villagers. And, and this world is a totally, I mean, can you imagine like the food's different. And for some of the men like Monfred Gans, who I write about a lot, he grew up as an Orthodox Jew. So mm -hmm. suddenly he's not allowed, he's not Jewish anymore. He has to pretend to be British. For him, that was okay because he, he, he said over and over again after the war, I would have done anything. It didn't matter what it would take, but it's hard though. Like he had to take his talus to fill in and he had to pack, like it, it was really strange. And then, so they lived with these Welsh villagers for a year and the Welsh villagers had a feeling something was strange about these guys. One of the villagers was interviewed after the war and she said that um, whenever we would say that these guys, where are you really from? They would say, we are English. So they like they knew something was up with them and they were all, they all had these fake stories of why they had these English accents. The local police had been told about what was really going on, but none of the villagers knew. They just knew something was strange. Um, and when they were billeted there, one of them, who I write a lot about, this guy, George Lane, was married to Miriam Rothschild, who's the, who was one of the Rothschilds. She was a very famous scientist in her own right in her life. And she did an amazing interview about the X Troop after the war. And I put one of her quotes in the book that I just thought was so emblematic. She said, you know, she said something like, the X Troop were not like other soldiers. You know, other soldiers would be like, you know, maybe drinking and smoking, whatever it was these guys would be talking about Schopenhauer and philosophy. And I thought, yeah, that kind of gets it. So that's what their training was. But Brian Helm Jones was determined to make them the fiercest warriors. So they did everything. They climbed mountains, they parachuted. They had to spend days with blindfolds on. So they got used to the dark. They had to learn all of the weapons. They, they had to land they did these landings in Scotland on a loch while they were doing live weapons pointed at them in the freezing night. And then after almost a year to sort of, you know, intense rigorous training, um, the, one of the final things was he had them all dropped off um, 
up in Scotland in the woods with nothing, freezing cold, and they had to survive and then make their way back to London. And they like stole Jeeps and all these things. One of them got arrested because of his accent. But the idea was to make them like the Spartans, that they could fight um, and, you know, and, and it worked. They were, I, I, I mean, as far as I can see, they were sort of the most highly trained unit in the British military. And you mentioned that at least one of these men uh, was Orthodox. In their testimony, did they ever talk about their attempts to maintain their faith, um, connections to their faith at this time that they're having to hide their identities? Well, most of them were fairly secular because this the sort of generation of German and Austrian Jews, um, often their parents were religious. And then with the rise of Nazism, their parents decided to maybe not tell their kids they were Jewish. So a lot of the guys talked about learning they were Jewish when they were like 12 and they didn't realize it, or their parents would convert or have them converted. So they came from these sort of, um, I guess, very quiet Jewish households, some of them, but a number of them, you know, had bar mitzvahs, you know, some of them were Orthodox. And, you know, the sort of a typical thing was, like I said, mom for guns, he comes from an Orthodox family. And when he's interred, I have this quote that he said in his memoir about it, where once when he's interred, he, he, he was Orthodox. So he only hung out with the fellow Orthodox Jews. They ate Orthodox fo- food. They prayed together three times a day. And he said he had a conversation with like one of the most religious of them saying like, when I get out of here, I wanna join the British military. And the guy said to him, you can't do that because then you're gonna live like a secular life. And this other guy who he felt was really intelligent chimed in and said, no, 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 it's a complete, it's a mitzvah to kill Nazis. And Manfred Gan said it just switched his brain at that point. So when he had to do all this stuff to not be Jewish, He was just playing the long game. He knew he would do whatever it takes. And then when the war is over and he's successful, he's gonna switch back. So for him, what he would do is things privately and quietly, but with, you know, he ate non-kosher food. He didn't do Shabbat, but he talked in his memoir, like he was very much aware of the Jewish holiday cycle. And so like he talked about his Yom Kippur and like for one of his Yom Kippur, he was hiding in these um, passageways being chased by Germans, it was crazy stuff. And then he said he went back to his room and he had to wash off all the filth. And he said like, that was my strangest Yom Kippur. So it was, he was always aware of it, Um, but for none of them, for for all of them, the most important thing was doing whatever it would take to beat the Nazis. And and I know that quite a few of these men, if not the majority of these men, did have the experiences of family whose lives or who had been arrested by the Nazis or whose lives were directly affected by the Nazis. Uh, Were there any of them that tried to deal directly with family that had been taken by the Nazis? Um, So it's sort of jumping ahead, but I'm happy to do it because um, we'll talk about the battles they went through, but so the minute the war ends, Mm -hmm. British soldiers go, this is great. I get to go home to my family get to get a job, I might, you know, maybe they need some like emotional help, I'll get that kind of stuff. These guys knew that with VE Day, the, the war was still on. And now they had the chance to go try and find family members. And this happened with all, all of them the minute the war ends. And I, I tell about three different stories, but I could have told you all of them. I'll just tell you a short one now and then I can tell you the longer one later. Um, like one of these guys I write about, Ron Gilbert, he fought, at the front of all the battles, he lands at D-Day. He's a, you know, when he's shot and he gets out, he's taken to the field hospital and he says, no, I'm going back to battle because they, they didn't want to, they were constantly given the opportunity to have the officer commissions and go to officer training school. They always said, no, they did not want to be away from the battle. They wanted to be there winning the war. So for him, when, when, um, when Paris is finally liberated from the Germans, he knows his sister has been hiding there. His parents were both killed in concentration camps. And the only person left is his sister and she's hiding somewhere in Paris. So when when Paris is liberated, he goes to his commanding officer who at this point knows this guy is like a superhero, you know, whatever. And then he says, can you just give me a Jeep for a week? I gotta go find my sister. And the guy says, I'm gonna give you a Jeep for a week. And he drives to Paris and he manages to find his sister. And I, the photos in the book, if people, 
for whatever reason, if uh, with any book, the most important thing about this book is the photos are crazy, the photos I got. So please get the book so you can see these photos. But there's a photo I have that I, I was given from his family of him when he reunites with his sister in Paris. And it wasn't just him. I mean, I have all these stories of men doing this. And so it was strange to write a Holocaust book that was actually extremely optimistic and positive because these guys got their power back. Mm -hmm. They fought really fiercely. They were crucial to the war. They captured hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Germans. And also, as the war's ending, they're able to go on these journeys to find family members. And did they have any benefit of British intelligence or was it kind of driven by their own tenacity to find the information and seek out their families? That's it. No one's ever asked me that. That's such a good question. They had no assistance from British intelligence. So when the British military creates this unit, and I, to write the book, I, I did it. I, I not only was really lucky because I got to interview some commandos who were still alive, but their, the families of the commandos were incredible and generous, and they all had their own family archives. So I got memoirs and photographs. And then I found out the United States Holocaust Museum had a bunch of archives. So I went there and the Pierrot War Museum had a bunch of archives and I went there. But to write the book, I also wanted to make sure whatever they said was factual. And the British military very fortunately keeps these very detailed, kept these very detailed war diaries. So if, if Ron Gilbert said, you know, I was in this battle and I killed this many Germans, I could go look at a war diary to make sure he remembered it accurately. And they all did, by the way. So I had a huge amount of material and I also had all the British records and there, there was something called the X Troop War Diary as well. And nobody, nobody ever used the word Jewish. They did not, that wasn't, it wasn't in any of the records. They were all Jewish, but it was German speakers. These were German speakers. So it would never, I don't think have, I don't know, occurred or been important to the British military to help these guys find their families. So the systems that they had to find their families were, were the systems that all Jews had, like mm -hmm. maybe there would be a letter from the Red Cross, maybe something would be smuggled out, but it all came bottom up, none of it came top down. Wow, that's insanely impressive. Yeah, it's insanely impressive. <laughs> And the way they got mail, just one other thing, because remember, they're all, they all have fake names, right? Mm -hmm. So Montfort Gans is now Fred Gray during the course of the war. So, the, so it was really important that there had to be a way to get mail to them, like, because his parents, I tell his whole story and his parents' story, but his parents had been captured and sent to Bergen-Belsen after they were in hiding and they were captured. And so there had to be a well, way for these guys to get mail. So the British military had them all create fake mailboxes under fake names and fake addresses and they all got to pick one person they trusted with the true story of who they were so he had had a landlord in Manchester who the letters would go to him and somehow as his parents were moved and the Red Cross was keeping track of some of these things it would go through this really convoluted like to an uncle in America to you know all over the world and eventually get to that mailbox and get to him wow um and I have so all those letters in the book too. Like I got to see all this stuff too. It was incredible. Yeah, I can imagine the archival research, the history nerd in me feels like all this archival research must have been so fun. I was <laughs> so through. fun. You're the host <laughs> of the first person to say that. I had the time of my life. I cannot tell you how joyful it was to write this. Particularly like there's this, I'll just tell you like one of many happy moments in writing this. So Mon Fergans, right, this Orthodox Jewish guy, he immediately, it's clear to everyone, like he's a Superman, right? He's so intelligent. He's so focused. During his training, he selected to go to Cambridge and do extra counterintelligence training. And he is sent at the front of this commando unit, uh, the Lands 41 commando unit. And, and I can talk in more detail, but like he, he's constantly capturing Germans. He's saving people's lives. He's getting incredibly crucial intelligence. And there's one point in one of his interviews, he said something sort of off the cuff, like, yeah, one night I went behind enemy lines to get, gather intelligence. And there were some Germans around, so I had to hide, and then I made my way back. So I was really curious. So I went to the war diary of 41 Commando for that night, and it had this great thing. It said something like, um, you know, uh, I, think, I think he was still a private at that point. Private Fred Gray disappeared tonight. 
He was supposed to go gather intelligence, but no one was worried. We all knew he'd get back. And in the morning, lo and behold, he walked right, you know, right through and said, hello, boys. And so I was like, oh my God, that's so great. So everyone knew he was a super bad. No, it was, it was so fun doing the archival research and meeting all the families. Oh my God. And I was gonna ask, you mentioned that you got one of their memoirs from a daughter. Um, what were the relationships did you build any relationships doing this research? Um, what was that process? It seems like even just reading your book, I feel intimately connected to these men. I can't imagine the connections that you must have made in doing the research and by figuring out their stories. Yeah, it was amazing because I got to know their kids and and it was sort of like when I would get in touch with families in the UK and the United States, and I would get in touch with someone it was like all these families were just waiting for someone to come to the door and say, can you tell me about the ex-troop? And uh -huh. they would be like, oh my God, let me tell you. And here's a photo, blah, blah, blah. And the families were all waiting for someone to write this book. And I got really lucky that I got to be the one to write this book. And I, di I did, and I have developed serious relations with their children um, and their grandchildren. I'm in touch with them. I, I love them. They're, I just feel familial with them. But I should say something about like this, um, because look, I, I'm writing a military history, but I'm a woman and I'm Jewish and I'm American. And I'm writing about a lot of these guys were British. And I was a little bit worried when I started, like, is this gonna be off-putting? Like, it's it's a pretty conservative world, this Brit the military history thing. And it was incredible also how much military historians were excited to help out. But part of the reason, I, I mean, part of the reason why it was really important to me to, to get to know their kids and to not just tell the story of them in war, but to tell pre-war and post-war was not only the Holocaust, but also, as a sort of gender thing that I wanted to hear how they were as fathers too. And I wanted to hear how they were as husbands and I wanted to hear how they were as grandparents. So I do have a final chapter where I tell you like what everyone did with their lives because mm -hmm. I often feel like military histories, they cut off right there. And I felt, I don't know if it's cause I'm a mother or a dog, I don't know what it is but I felt like I wanted to do a different type of military history where I told you their whole stories. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I feel very similarly with a lot of Holocaust history. You hear the worst moments of people's lives, and there's so much more to being a human and a person, and they have yeah, that's what families and spouses yeah. and moments of joy that I think are so important to telling their stories. I totally agree. And these guys were all on a redemptive journey. Like they were redeeming the world. It wasn't just like they were making the world better. They were beating the Nazis, and they were so crucial in all of these battles that I talk about, but mm. I felt that way too. I wanted to remember, first of all, that they 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 regained their agency in this book and they regained their power. Um, but second of all, that they not only were extraordinary soldiers, but they were amazing dads too. And I talk about that and great husbands and, you know, wonderful sons. So I felt it was really important to do the full picture as well. So there's like a lot, if you, if, if, if the audience is into like war stuff, there's great war stuff in here. But if you're also into sort of like more sort of individual journeys, I have that stuff there too. And this really felt like a very accessible book. I think I've told everyone I know about it. But oh. you have the military history and kind of, it feels like an action movie and it's very interesting from that point. Then you have very human stories and it's just, it reads almost like a novel where it's just, such interesting information. And then it's so much cooler that this all really happened and these are real people in the world. I know that that's what I honestly, like as I would read, read, write each chapter and I hope people will read the book and see this, they were in the most important moments in the war. Like one of them I talk about had a private meeting with Rommel, mm -hmm. which I talk about. They Another one saves Lord Lovett, who's this huge figure in World War II history. They're landing at these most, so they're kind of at the, the forefront of all of these battles. And that was actually, to be honest, the hardest part, part by writing the book because I had to give you a full basic overview of all World War II history mm -hmm. we did as well. Cause the guys are in Sicily or they're wherever without, we were trying really hard not to make it boring. That was like very hard, that stuff. That was definitely the hardest thing was doing this sort of filler history stuff. 
but I knew that like I would lose people unless if people, you know, people sort of know what DD is, but I got to tell you what Sword Beach is where they're all landing and you won't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what was so incredible about the, the story. When I wrote it, I kept thinking, God, this is, these guys are also a way to tell like the history of World War II because they're there at all those battles, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm going to do one more of the questions on my list and then move us on to some audience questions. Uh, I know that quite a few of them kept their new names and identities. Why? Why? <laughs> so that was another strange part about the book, which when I start to interview the families I, and I start to go through all the records, I realized that virtually every single one of them, except for Monfred Gans, the Orthodox mm -hmm. guy who becomes Fred Gray, keep their fake names after the war. So the, the person they become in that 10 minutes is who they become and their children have those names and their grandchildren and their great girl grandchildren all took those names. And so I thought a lot about why was that? And I think it was for a number of reasons. As one of them said, daughter said to me, my dad wanted to be more British than the British. So part of it was, I think, a sort of sense mm -hmm. of insecurity that they sort of had to continue to prove themselves to the British that they were worthy and that meant hiding their Jewishness. A lot of them hid their Jewishness after the war, hiding their real names. Interestingly, most of those who emigrated to the United States became Jewish again and reclaimed their Jewishness, but those who stayed in the UK became very, very British. I think it's also because they became, they transformed into these commandos when they were like turning 18, when they were becoming adults. And that is who they became as adults. They became these commando men. And I also think the other reason is that their birth names, much as we have with immigrants to Israel who changed their name after the war, their birth names reminded them of their moms who they lost mm -hmm. or their dads or that whole story that was so painful for them. It makes complete sense to me the way people did this in Israel as well, that you create or you take hold of this new name so you can reinvent yourself. And that, and for them, they weren't really reinventing themselves because they became th that person. But for a number of them, you know, their kids would say like, they would talk about the war, but they were not willing to talk about the pre-war stuff and they didn't want to go there. Mm -hmm. So um, speaking about their ages, we have kind of a historical question. Uh, an age limit for the kinder transport and our commenter says that these guys seem a bit older than what we picture about kinder transport. That's a really good question. Okay, so whenever these guys were on kinder transport, they were always the oldest one in the group, right? So it's more that they slipped through, like one of them was like 16, one was 17. And the way their parents worked, it was like this slightly older child can assist whoever is getting the children out. And, and they ended up being really important on the kinder transport. Colin Anson, who I write about, the one who lost his dad in Dachau, I think it's 16, he's 16 when his mom puts him on the train with this guy on the kinder transport. And as they pull out of, um, I think they're in Hamburg, no, Frankfurt, as they pull out of the station, he's kind of given the task to help this guy who's the chaperone look after the, the little kids. And I tell this terrible scene where, and this happened over and over again on the kinder transports where these slightly older ex troopers were, where the Nazis in their daily cruelty with his um, train, but it happened with a number of the men, got onto the car, saw there were all these Jewish kids, had the train stop, even though these kids were allowed to leave because the Quakers were overseeing it, made all of these Jewish kids jump off the side of the train poor Colin Anson, the ex-troopers, he's there and he's a little bit older. They're scraping their knees. It's just terrible. The Germans go through all of their suitcases and then he helps them get back on the train and then goes, goes their way. So whoever said that is absolutely right. They were the absolute oldest limit and their parents kind of had to work it to get them on those trains. But a lot of them didn't go to with Kinder Transport. Like Monfort Gans, his father gave him a ticket and said, I love you, son, um, try and get away. Yeah. And I remember, I do not remember who it was, but one of the stories at the beginning of the book, one of them is with, with his father at a pub. And his father says something to a couple of men speaking Nazi rhetoric, and he ends up getting arrested and he goes to see him. And instead of doing a dad thing of just like embracing him, he's just like, go, you have to get out. And yeah. the sacrifice that their parents made of 
saving their lives that way is so heart-wrenching and impressive and yeah and people like whenever people say that stupid thing about why didn't the Jews get out of Germany and Austria what they really don't remember is there was nowhere they could go mm-hmm. I mean the only reason that these kids were allowed to go was because of the kinder transport said we're going to take a certain amount or or at that point Britain had a good sort of transit visa program which is what Montfort Gans used so you could pretend that you were going to go there and you had somewhere else to go but um there was nowhere for them to go. These, these guys I write about were the lucky few who managed to get mm-hmm. away. And we have a couple of post-war questions. Uh, the first, for their post-war activities during like denazification, were they still kind of widespread or did they consolidate with each other since so many other troops were done with the war at this point? God, these are such good questions. So. Um, they were sent all over the place, but it, it's the, my stuff on the denazification I find so compelling and strange and interesting. Like again, Montfort Gans, right? He grows up in this town called Borken in Germany. Like I said, Orthodox Jewish. He has a really good childhood. His family's upper middle class. And um, he's really happy. Rise of Nazism comes. And suddenly like they get rid of all the good teachers, anti-Semitic teachers come in. They get rid of the mayor. And... Nazism gets takes fierce hold of his town. So when denazification happens, and this happens over and over again, the British military decides Montfort Gans is going to be sent back to Borken and be in charge of denazification from his hometown. Amazing, because he knew who the good guys were and he knew who the bad guys were. And mm-hmm. so all of them are spread all over the place, mostly in areas where they came from originally, but they do such a like Jewish take on it. Another guy, Ron Gilbert, who I mentioned, um, who finds his sister, he's sent to do denazification in a town and he decides he's only gonna give ration books to the Germans after they sit and watch um, the film of the extermination camps. Like they knew exactly what they were gonna do. And so they're spread all over the place for the denazification, but they've all, they, they all became very close during that training in Wales. They, they truly become a band of brothers. One of the commanders who was still alive when I interviewed him, I could tell when he talked about it, like, because they lost so much, these guys were their brothers. So they all stayed in touch through the war and after the war. So when they're sent to these different places after the war, they do stay in touch with one another, Mm -hmm. Um, but their job is twofold. Either they're given like uh, Ron Gilbert, um, he's also given a pistol and said, go find Nazis who are hiding. And he goes all over and he captures Nazis. It's very exciting. And others like Monfort Gans, after he's sent to Borken, is sent to interrogate very high-ranking Nazis to get evidence for the Nuremberg trials. Mm-hmm. So they're all, so they're all over the place and absolutely crucial um, from like 1945 to 1947. And just one other point: this this is a really weird time for them because the British decide that they're going to naturalize other commando units that are foreign. Like there's a French commando unit and they're Polish. They don't naturalize the ex troop and. I did a bunch of research and it looks to me that there was just one guy in the war office who was pretty anti-Semitic. Everyone else wanted to naturalize them. So from 45 to 47, they're essentially stateless. After all they've done, they're commanding officers fighting so hard to get them naturalized and they're doing denazification stuff. It's, t- it's so difficult for them this period. And then in 47, they finally get naturalized and they can remain in Britain if they want. But a number of them come to the United States or go to Canada. And the idea of them keeping in touch after kind of splitting off leads me to our next question. Um, did they ever gather for ex-troop reunions um, or did they kind of try to separate from the war after, after everything was These over? These are great questions. So Peter Masters was one of the men I talk about. He comes from Vienna. He's incredible. He kind of, like I, I told you, like he escapes with his family. He's an artist in Vienna, very middle class. He transforms into this incredible warrior. He lands at D-Day on a bicycle, which is a whole nother story in the book and gets to Pegasus Bridge. So he's at the forefront of everything. When the war ends, he's the only one who refuses to do the denazification. He says, I'm never stepping foot again in Germany or Austria, I will not do it. So he gets sent to West Africa. After the war, he gets a Fulbright to America, to Yale, one of the first artists Fulbrights. And he, you know, he, he marries this beautiful woman who I interviewed for the book. And there's a lot of women in the book. Um, 
and he makes his way to DC and, and, and I interviewed his son and his son said his best friends his whole life were always the ex-troopers. So he actually sets up like these yearly reunions with the ex-troopers and they all stay in touch through Peter Masters. But there's a moment when it gets really difficult in the early nineties because a group of them who are still in the United Kingdom who are, have not let people know that they're Jewish or know their backstory, decide that they're gonna create a memorial to the ex-troop. And they make the decision, they make this beautiful memorial where they trained in Wales, it's still there. It will not say the word Jewish on it. And, yeah. and Peter Masters fought them, Manfred Gans fought them, Miriam Rothschild fought them. And this group was determined to kind of keep the cover or you know, internal anti-Semitism, I don't know what it was. So that memorial is still there and it talks about them and doesn't say they were Jewish. And this was a Jewish troop. They fought as Jews. They fought um, personally. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So just final point on that memorial, which is actually, there's this vet called Martin Sugarman. He's a Jewish vet who runs the, this Jewish veteran organization in the UK. And his whole life has been about talking about Jewish vets. And he has been writing to the Aberdovey Town Council like every month saying you have to put the word Jewish on it. And he shared all the emails and they're still saying they're not gonna do it. So he commissioned a local artist in Aberdovey to make a little bronze star of David that's now at the base of it. And so what he tells people and I tell people is if you ever go there, bring a star of David and photos now of the memorial, you can see a bunch of little stars of David at the bottom, but it hasn't happened formally and the town council is not gonna change it. And there's actually a question directly about if that effort was ongoing, so. Yes, it's on. And there's also, I should say, one other ongoing effort that particularly Martin Sugarman's in charge of is the fact that if they were killed in war, they were buried under crosses. Mm -hmm. And that's been pretty contentious too, because um, he's been getting and trying and working to get them all changed to Stars of David. But occasionally he comes across families who don't wanna do that. It's just, it's again, this strange aspect of this sort of cloak and dagger thing of these guys. So, so that's an ongoing thing too. Like I heard of, I was getting letters from kids of different commandos where one wanted it changed to Star of David and the other didn't. Very interesting. Um, so the next one that I see, just the first one by my eyes, um, did the X troop ever cross paths with the Ritchie boys or another similar unit from the US? I think there were a couple on our side. Um, no, because first of all, because they were so top secret, these guys, right? So they and second of all, yeah. yeah, and also because they're so different from the Ritchie boys because they're primarily commanders who are also counterintelligence officers. So who they're crossing path with, with constantly are other commandos. But it's really interesting um, like when they land at D-Day, they're, they're of course landing with Americans, right? And they always wrote and talked about the Americans in the most glorious way. They felt like the American soldiers were like the most hardworking soldiers and they were so interesting and their food was great. So they all had these sort of like love for the American troops, but they never crossed paths because they were so different. And the X troop was so top secret that through the course of the war, there was only one secretary at MI5 who had a list of their real names. And I got to see that list, which was very cool, but nobody, nobody knew about them. Officially, the X troop was called the British troop, which is so funny. So there were supposed to be this British commando troop. So that's, and, and they were also called three troops. So it, there was never mm -hmm. any kind of like close, relationship between between these different again also because the Ritchie boys weren't commandos and commandos served very differently from counterintelligence officers and um, on the theme of Americans uh, there's a question of can you compare this book and story to Tarantino's satiric <laughs> glorious bastards which I believe is very very loosely based off of the Ritchie boys um so that is a great question so when that movie came out, a number of the commandos were still alive and they wrote a bunch of letters about it that I got to read at the Imperial War Museum. And they were enraged about the movie because the thing about the X troop was that they were, Tarantino's movie, which I actually quite like, is a total revenge fantasy. It's like, mm -hmm. he does these revenge fantasies. He did it with slavery. He does it with the Holocaust. And they 
were not about revenge. They were about, the real X troop was about following the rules of war, being ethical. I mean, they would interrogate people who, who you know, might've been at the camp where their moms were killed. They would still follow the rules of war because they wanted to right the world. They wanted to do, do it properly. Mm -hmm. They said over and over again, they want to show the world that we're nothing like the Germans. We are completely different. We have a higher moral standard. And it's interesting, Peter Masters, the guy who's the artist who I talked about, who gets the Fulbright, his daughter, Kim Masters, is a really important um, reporter for The Hollywood Reporter. And when Tarantino's movie came out, she wrote it, which everyone can Google, it's a great piece. She, she wrote an article that says, my father was the real and glorious bastard because these guys were the real guys. And she really talks about how wrong Tarantino got it. So the, the, the movie sort of was loosely based on these guys, but couldn't have gotten it more wrong, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are a couple of questions. Is there any type of documentary or movie under consideration about the X troop? Well, I have an agent in Hollywood. We'll see where it goes. I don't know. You know, this stuff happens. I don't know. We can I, all cross our fingers. Cross our fingers. Yeah. They interviewed me for C-SPAN last weekend, which was really cool. But the thing that, you know, sort of, and then I got interviewed yesterday for a local rate TV station. It was really interesting because, and he said, do you have any like video material? And the only video that we have of the X troop was this incredible moment I write about in the book when one of them, Ian Harris single-handedly captures an entire German bat bat battalion of like hundreds and hundreds of Germans. And it was caught on these newsreels and he's sitting in the Jeep and I have the picture in the book. So get the book so you can see this picture and he's driving along all these Germans behind him. Um, and But there's no other video footage. So like I, I've been thinking like, how would you do a documentary about it? But there are these amazing photos. So what we have mostly is photos and not so much video. As far as I can see, I haven't been able to locate other stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping it's made into a documentary because that'd be wonderful. And um, so we know that some of these men went to the UK, stayed in the UK, some of them came to the US. Did any of them go immigrate to Israel or fight in the War of Independence following World War II? So, um, Monfred Gans, again, I keep talking about him because he's just so great and I focus a lot of him in the book. His parents, um, a big story I tell is about his parents who are taken to Bergen-Belsen and then terrorism stock concentration camp. And I write this inc incredible true tale of when the war hasn't ended yet. He decides he's gonna go rescue his parents from terrorism mm -hmm. concentration camp and he gets a Jeep. And he wrote a diary of it, which was at the Holocaust Museum, which I used for the book. And this is an optimistic book. And so we can guess where this is going. He drives through Germany and it's incredible. This should be its own book, the story of him rescuing his parents. His parents emigrate to Israel after the war and his brother emigrates to Israel after the war. And his brother serves in the military and is like a major military figure. But as far as I can see, there's only loose connections like that with Israel. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't find anyone who had emigrated to Israel. Um, and I don't, I, I couldn't find any relationship between sort of the train. It's too bad because they would have been incredible yeah. to train Israelis, but I couldn't find any particular association. And after the war, after 47, when they're finally naturalized and they can leave and, you know, Many of them just want to have a quiet life at that point. Oh, they yeah. all go on and do great things like Monfort Gans goes to MIT and becomes a chemist, you know, Peter Masters becomes, you know, they do this amazing stuff, but many of them just want sort of a quiet life after the war. So only a few of them, and this guy here on the cover, Jeff Broadman holding this Tommy gun, he spends his life in the British military and his kids did too and his grandkids, but most of them sort of do a clean break after 1947. And our final question for before we wrap everything up, um, what was your motivation in writing about this story or kind of how did you first discover the spark of this incredible, almost like surreal tale? Um, so my last book before this book was called Young Lions, and it was about Jewish American GIs. Um, 
and it was about Jews who served in the American military in World War II, but I focused on those who became famous writers like Norman Mailer and Joseph Heller, Herman Wouk, and others. And the, I, I initially wrote that book because my grandfather, Abraham Klein, was in the military. All my great uncles served in World War II. They all served in World War II, so I was so interested in it. When I wrote that book, I thought, okay, I've got it out of my system. I totally didn't have it out of my system. I still wanted to write about Jews in World War II. And I'd heard this rumor about this commando unit. And I did a bit of investigation. And um, there was like a little bit here and a little bit there. And then I thought, oh my God, I get to write this book. It's like a book that's waiting for somebody to write it. It gets to be me. This is so great. So it was my interest in World War II, my interest in Jew Jewish history, because I, I write about Jewish history. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then this kind of fell in my lap. And for me, the, I knew I had to do it pretty quickly because there were commandos still alive I needed to interview. And luckily I was able to do that. But it, the whole trajectory was like three and a half years from discovering no one had written the book to publishing it. It just was super fast, super intense. Families, everybody connecting me up and then it just flowed, it flowed, it flowed. That is an amazing set of circumstances for a truly amazing story. Thank and you. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, I'm very, very glad that I got to delve a little bit deeper into the story and your experiences with it. And I will pass it on to Amy to close us out of our program.